Teaching on the Theology of Play. On this episode of Board Game Faith, the bi-weekly show exploring the intersection of religion, spirituality, and board games. Kevin, every week I look forward to like virtually uh, jamming with you to our theme song. I, 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 uh, it's, it's a highlight. Brief, of the... but it's potent. It's brief. <laughs> it's brief, but potent. Full of possibilities. Brief possibilities. Yeah, brief possibilities. Brief, brief possibilities poss- of joy. <laughs> it's the name of my autobiography, too. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Brief possibility. Possibly on my tombstone. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Oh, well, no. uh, welcome everybody to Board Game Faith. It is uh, great to have you here. Thanks for tuning in. My name is uh, Daniel Hilty, and my name is Kevin Taylor. And uh, Kevin, it is great to uh, to see you a- again. To be talking with you. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm really good, Daniel. Thanks. Yes, and you? Clean good, shaven, good. sparkly, and clean shaven. Well, you're 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 kind. Yes, for for those of you who are watching this on. On the YouTubes, you may notice that yeah, I've, I've shaved. If you've watched this before, so I I have a love hate relationship with like facial hair, right? With like mustache mm. and beard. Like on, I'll um, uh, um, I, I I'm I'm shaven for a while, and then I'll think, you know, that just looks weird, and then I'll and then I'll grow out a beard and mustache, and then I think, you know, that just like accelerates the old man look i need to shave it off and then i'm just i'm very Mm, fickle mm -hmm. very fickle but you seem to be you seem to have decided on the beard and you're just going with because it looks good on you but i I know it's good on you thank you thank you yeah uh uh, it definitely is a bit of work like maintenance Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know yeah so yeah i know what you mean sometimes you're just like "Ah, i just want to tear it off yeah and you're and and you you and it's still like dark right when i grow up my beard now it's just it's mostly gray and i just uh, i feel like from this angle it, it's getting grayer yeah okay okay yeah well yes um w- w- regardless of uh um of of whether you sport facial hair or not we are grateful that you're listening today dear listeners um That's right. and we're grateful to have you here um and today we're going to be discussing um, teaching the theology of play or, or teaching about the theology of play. And um, this is something that we kind of dance around every episode, really, um, Kevin, don't we? But, but, um, but this, is, uh, this episode is specifically about a very kind of intentional focused experience of, of teaching on the theology of play. Yes, although to be honest, I was fortunate enough to get to teach a class kind of about religion and board games and we'll put a link to that above if you're curious absolutely um, so yeah we yeah, had a really good episode on that a few episodes did. back we yeah. did and we've learned a lot since then and you've learned a lot since then and i've learned a lot since then so i'm really curious to see what new stuff came about as well as you were at a retreat setting versus uh non-compliant 19 year olds so it's very different <laughs> type of yeah the non-compliant pastors, really. Well, right. but I'm I'm glad you made that that comparison, though. I mean, you're right, because yeah. So we, we've had a couple episodes now about teaching on the theology of play, and, and you're exactly mm-hmm. right. Yeah, yours from the perspective of a college uh, professor, um, like you said, teaching a class, and then you're right. Then today I, I'm discussing, uh, uh, like like you have alluded to, kind of a, it was a it was a uh, a voluntary spiritual retreat mm-hmm. um, for. Um, for church, church folks, mostly pastors, but also some lay folks too. So, right. Yeah, yeah. So, tell me about it. Uh, tell me about the context. Where, where, where did you all go for this retreat? Yeah. Well, thank you. So this was a uh, this was a uh, a five day four night retreat, though I only taught for three days at um, at Glen Erie Castle in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And um, how far this, is that? Well, from, I flew, I flew um, from here where I am in Missouri. Um, um, I, I understand it probably would have been like a 10 hour drive, which I know 
is not a answer to the question in terms of distance, but it, it, in terms of average driving speed on American highways, I think it's about a 10 hour drive from here, but I, gotcha. I flew. So is that yeah. common to have a retreat from, from Missouri, go to Colorado? Do you lack confidence in your own home state is part of the question. <laughs> that is kind of a very Missouri thing to, uh, is it? to, uh, but no, uh, actually this is, this is unusual. Uh, this is, this was the fourth in a series of spiritual retreats that um, our denominational conference office was sponsoring with the Missouri Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Um, and, um, and all of the other uh, previous spiritual retreats, these spiritual formation retreats had been held in Missouri at retreat centers mm -hmm. in Missouri. But this was the fourth one. And at least this was the last one in their original design. We're hoping there'll be some more, but right now it's the last one planned. So they thought they would end this series of four uh, kind of on sense. a really special note. Yeah. So right. we went to this, this beautiful retreat center um, uh, outside of, it's on the edge of the Garden of the Gods. And it's this beautiful uh, castle uh, surrounded by um, just beautiful, um, hmm. uh, beautiful estate. Retreat center? Is it it is owned and operated by, I didn't realize till we, this till we got there, owned and operated by the Navigators, which is a publishing house and also uh -huh. uh, for um, a, a Christian publishing house. Um, it also runs some, I think there were some summer camps and uh, they have other activities too besides the publishing house. Mm -hmm. But they perhaps might be best known, or at least one of the reasons they're especially known today is the message translation of the Bible, Eugene uh, Peterson, okay. um, yep. was published by the, the Navigators. Um, so they I really own like that translation, by the way, you don't like that translation. Oh, it's so corny and <laughs> I don't trust one person. I, I, I thought it was remarkable. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time with one it. person I, could I, do I, it. I, yeah. I did, yeah. That's a snap judgment. No, I just, I, I have to admit, I, 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 it, I liked it for many years. For many years, it was it was something. It was the go-to translation for me, just because I because it was a kind of a fresh take on things. But I, I've, I'm not quite into it as as much anymore I for see. a variety of reasons. But um, here's, it, it, I guess here's the thing: it's fine as a as something on your desk or something to read. But I don't like it in church. It's just it it it's too jarring for my mind. Mm -hmm. Not that it has to be a fancy translation, but right, right. it's just a little too whimsical. It seems mm -hmm. to me. I could, I could see you, that. Did yeah. you know there's a new translation for the NRSV? There's an NRSVUE or something? Yes, like I've heard updated. that. Yeah, yeah that's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, that's cool. I, I haven't gotten a copy yet. I need to check that out. Or a copy, mm -hmm. whatever you call a digital version of something now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's cool. So, yeah, it was it was great. And it was surrounded by, you know, mountains and hikes. And so we... Um, we stayed in a little um, lodge next to the castle. There was about 33 of us. Um, and um, again, mostly United Methodist pastors, but also some lay folks uh, as well. And um, lay folks, for those who are unfamiliar with church jargon, that just means uh, church people who are not pastors. Um, and um, <laughs> it's, um, in other words, normal people. <laughs> right, right. Not right, the weird right. clergy people. Um, and, um, like me, um, like us. And, uh, so we would have for three of those days, we had two hour teaching sessions, which is the parts that I taught on the theology of play. But then there was also times when we would meet with spiritual directors. There were spiritual directors there and that was really helpful. Um, really meaningful. We also had worship experiences there. We had a wonderful worship leader there as well. Um, and then went on hikes and at night, Kevin, there, there might have been some some impromptu uh, board games, uh, <gasps> unscheduled board games. Some some of us may have packed board games in our suitcases. In fact, some oh. of us may not have brought any clothes because <laughs> we just I brought was, board games. I was You're just wearing was, the Catan I, box. That's exactly you know. right. That's that's really all you need. That's all you need. Um, he couldn't lean in the desk because it would put a dent in his box. That's exactly, yeah, Greek. yeah. Had good posture. <laughs> wow, that is awesome. So that was six hours, really, three two-hour sessions. That's pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, thank so you. So how did you thank break you. down that time? How did you yeah, structure it? Yeah, thanks. Well, and I also, and I should let you know here at the beginning, I also uh, acknowledged you over the course of 
those three days as the silent partner in uh, in uh, in the, in the lessons and said that you know that investor that the things that we talked about um, uh, actually I think I called you the invisible voice but we the things that, that that I talked about were things that you and I had kind of hashed out in this podcast and over and in conversations outside this podcast over the last year and a half so p- please know you deservedly were a big part of that as well. But yeah, so over the course of three days, I broke it down. The first day we called Introduction to Play and why play is an important uh, part of human spiritual experience. And then um, the second day was Barriers to Play. So, you know, why are we reluctant to play? Why, why is it hard to play? What stands in the way of play? And then the third day was how we can move toward a more playful life, you know, Hmm. given that play is important spiritually, but um, given that it's hard for us to say yes to play, what were some concrete steps we could take to move toward a more playful life? Are are you familiar with the idea of three acts and and creative writing? Because that's what you've done here. Oh, okay. Maybe not. uh, um, Like you set um, it up and then you have the essential conflict or question and then there's a resolution okay okay yeah yeah maybe so i didn't i didn't really think about that but i guess i guess that was kind of yeah the uh, the setup the conflict and the resolution yeah huh yeah hero's journey wow that's awesome so who are some of your major conversation partners here besides the invisible one the invisible yeah you mean like like different like um you will not um, see me but you will feel me (laughs) kevin is always present um, and he smells slightly funny. <laughs> what is that? Smells that, of fennel. <laughs> what is that smell? Do I smell awesomeness? That's Kevin must so be awesome. nearby. <laughs> the smell of awesomeness and hope. Uh, um, it's like a brand new Superman cape. He just sort of crisp and smells like. <laughs> oh, oh, to Kevin. Oh, to Kevin. Kryptonian hint, hint, fabric. Hints of awesomeness with undertones of. Um, Kryptonite, yeah, a crypt, right? Yeah. Um, friendly masculinity, not toxic, friendly, just friendly. Yeah, that's right. I like it. Just happy I, I, masculinity. I, I, Ted I would Lasso buy it. smell. <laughs> the Ted Lasso smell. <laughs> the Ted Lasso. I would buy it. Um, so yeah, so the, you know the um, there were a number of authors and books that I especially uh, drew from, uh, apart from Kevin, of course, um, but. Um, uh, Bernard Suits the Grasshopper was probably the major one, but um, mm-hmm. that he, he his was kind of the thread that ran throughout all three days. Um, but also Jane McGonigal's um, Reality is Broken. By the mm-hmm. way, dear listeners, um, if this is your first time listening, you may be interested to know we, we discussed those books in depth in previous episodes. So if you're interested in learning more about either of those books, please go to our website. And above. You can, yep, you can find uh, discussions of those books. Um, also... Um, uh, we, uh, we discussed, uh, um, um, Jürgen Moltmann's Theology of Play, which we also have mm-hmm. a discussion of in a previous episode. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel's The Sabbath, which is not a book that we have discussed yet, but that might be a good book for us to discuss at some Probably point. Probably should. Yeah. 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 Um, those were the, uh, the primary, uh, books that I I, drew from kind of conversation partners. But I also discussed a little bit. um, um, We discussed Martin Luther King Jr. um, Some comments from him um, over the course of of um, of the three days. I I brought in um, the keynote lecture from the play conference that I attended uh, a little bit over a year ago, the National Conference on the uh, Value of Play. So yeah, those were some of the primary um, conversation partners, and then, and then, you know, above all the uh, well, in scripture, we we talked a fair amount about different Bible passages as well, and mm-hmm. uh, and then we did a lot of small group there. discussion. Yeah, um, uh, Genesis, uh, for example, Genesis uh, three, reflecting on uh, the story of the uh, what's sometimes called the original sin, though that's not the term the Bible really ever uses for it, but Adam and Eve and the serpent in Genesis chapter three. Um, discussed that, um, discussed also, uh, first Corinthians chapter one, um, contrasting, um, God's wisdom and God's foolishness. It's kind of a contrast between 
sometimes a playful life looks foolish in the eyes of the world. Um, and uh, we discussed the Sermon on the Mount at some point as well. Um, and so yeah, just different different scripture passages. Mm -hmm. And then we did a lot of small group discussion and the participants offered their own insights and we really built a lot of, of what they were talking about there too. They really had a lot of great insights. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those were and the most- And you played some games as well. We played some games, yeah. Um, the first day we played just one. Um, and um, just one, uh, this, uh, uh, which I've played with large groups before and they always seem to enjoy it, but it was hard. I, was tr I had trouble thinking about how to do this with 33, 35 that is people. That hard bit, yes, yes. So you know, I, I found something that actually worked. Um, on on a uh, on online, I found packs of um, uh, twelve packs of um, dry erase name tags that you can put mm -hmm. on clips with, and each name tag came with a dry erase marker, and so they were made designed to be uh, rewritable name tags. You know, okay, um, they were just placards that you would you would buy separate clips to put on the top. So I got these twelve packs of um, dry erase name tags and dry erase markers that, so there was 24 items total in each pack and I got three of those and they was pretty cheap so that was a and so instead of using the just one little dry erase uh, card holders um, they were just these these little like two by three two and a half by three and a half dry erase um, cards that you could use and it was a really cheap way for a large number of us to play just one and I divided us up into like groups of seven and that worked well I also played uh, Wits and Wagers with the mm -hmm. group because I'd, I had heard that that was good for large groups to do that happens at board game conferences a lot. Um, and I'm sure the people who know how to do it, know how to do it well, for whatever reason, I kind of struggled a little bit doing mm -hmm. it with a large group. Um, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I don't think I would use that again for me personally, just cause I don't quite seem to know how to do it with a large group as well. I think if I did it again, I might break the group up and do play some version of the mind. I thought that might be a little bit more more fun. And then on the final day, I had people do um, simplified character creation sheets as if they were playing Dungeons and Dragons. And that, um, yeah, which is something I borrowed from a, a previous guest, Mandy Hutchinson, for those of you who, mm -hmm. another previous episode, if you want to look back and hear more about that from Mandy Hutchinson. So, Yeah. Um, and how so did the character games. creation go? And I don't, I'm not familiar with what she's got there. Yeah, it was um, – so Mandy Hutchinson, for the, those of us who may be unfamiliar with her, she is a board game reviewer and content creator about board games. But uh, on the internet, a wonderful a former ge – a previous guest here, a really neat mm -hmm. person. But she's also an educator um, during the day. And uh, right now she is educating uh, adults and does adult training programs. And she shared that one of the adult training programs that she does is um, doing character creation sheets for like role playing. And where as an intentional way of getting people to think about what skills do you need to meet this challenge? What skills do you possess oh, meeting right, this challenge? Right. And what are your growing edges? What are your weaknesses? Um, what allies do you need? Uh, how can friends help you in your, where maybe you are not as strong? And what equipment do you need to face these challenges? And what's your class? Like, what's your role? Are you a healer? Are you a, you know, or whatever? And so, and then draw a picture of your character. And so that's what, that's what we did. I made this kind of simplified character creation sheet. And the challenge was, this was our closing activity, was to encourage people to think about what do you need to, to go back into the world leading a more playful life? You know, how, mm. how can you lead a more mm -hmm. playful life? And so I was trying to encourage people to think about what strengths do they have already to help lead a playful life what are their what challenges do they face kind of internally and externally to lead a more playful life who are your allies who can help you lead a more playful life what equipment do you have draw a picture of your playful life avatar avatar self and um so yeah that's mm. kind of how we how mm -hmm. we tackled that so thanks to mandy for the good idea on how to how to do that but you you felt like it didn't go over very well is that correct and well some of your comments yeah you made? That was interesting. Some, I don't think I gave them enough time. So that was okay. part of it. I was running out of time. It was the last day. Someone had the good suggestion. Um, my, my, my good friend, Chris, who listens to the podcast. So, hey, Chris. Hello, um, Chris. Um, he had the good suggestion that maybe that would have been a good thing to pass out at the end of day two so that people could have had 
overnight to work on it and then bring it back on day three. So it wasn't quite right. so hurried. Um, but also, and this was this surprised me. Um, that was the activity we did that probably some people were the most resistant to. Mm. And and I, I don't mean that in a mean way. And, and they, and I think they said this too, that it just, it for some people, it was probably the most foreign to how their brains were wired and how their hearts were, were right. wired. And, so it needs and more it was, of a setup kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, the D&D &D players who were in the group, they were like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And they could whip yeah. it out in like five minutes. It's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. But for some people for whom this was a completely foreign concept, it was a real struggle to try to to try to. So it'd be to interesting to talk with Mandy how she couches and sets it up because I can yeah I can definitely see that that if you're you don't understand the value or just don't know what you're doing then it it may seem kind of weird or nonsensical. Yeah, because it, yeah. it it's it it has to be placed in its frame, and that's, that's a right. tricky thing. It's it, it's kind of like handing someone Monopoly pieces and they're like so what do i do with these like then it doesn't make sense without the game structure yeah so you have to yeah. give them something of that board game framing You're like this is where your top hat goes right that's a good point yeah framing yeah. it within the larger narrative of what are role-playing games and how do they work and which i did not do or even maybe playing a sample version so then they can see okay this is why i want the archery skill yeah that's yeah, a good idea know. I'm I'm just of course just riffing here. I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but but, no, but I can I like... see that it seemed like, a, and of course this is anything. It seems great on paper. Do you know it's going to work? No, you you execute the play and then you revise and you iterate. So that's it's exactly good for you right for trying this and and being inspired and wanting to check this out. And now now you know how to uh, iterate and innovate. Well, thanks. Based on thank that you, feedback, thank you. right? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just so grateful for the leaders of the conference and their kind invitation to yeah. kind of allow, allow me to give a tr I have yeah, to admit, try. I'm that probably from a that. bad cut. I'm the one that can be like, well, I don't want to do this. I, I don't know why. There's a bit of me that's a, that's a, I'm not really a rebel unless sometimes in that group setting where you're supposed to share. I'm someone yeah. who's like, well, I don't feel like sharing. So I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there yeah. are too many Kevins in the audience. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I sometimes balk at those things and, and I'm very moody, I think. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, is it? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. I, I can understand that. Yeah. I wonder why that is, whether it feels more of an obligation than a, it, it, sometimes it can feel, and this is me, but it's an obligation or it's, it's an expectation, but, but it's also, you know, I don't, I guess if I'm not expecting it or I don't have anything to add, then you end up, it can be kind of a, but we have to fill out this, what is it, the big sheets of paper that get torn off? Like we have to put something on here, but nobody really knows what to put. Right, right. The flip charts and the... The flip charts and you're like, yeah. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. Waterfalls, right? Yeah. So you kind of get stuck. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't go chasing... The, the waterfalls I've um never yeah that is a weird mixed metaphor isn't it don't go chasing waterfalls yeah I've never really thought they don't about move. it I guess it's really more of hunt, finding them I would be interested to find the the history of the phrase don't go chasing waterfalls I think it maybe means our listeners don't... would know I think the song to be honest I think the song is kind of deep it's about don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good like don't go looking for perfection like the perfect waterfall okay maybe okay. that's what it is it's like a travel it's like the gnome traveling the world looking for the perfect waterfall so don't oh. go looking for the perfect waterfall okay stick, okay yeah Please but you really don't chase the... the waterfall as they can't run away that's true that's true unless you're yeah. like chasing them like in a barrel like at niagara falls or like you're going <laughs> You're chasing him like that. I got him. <laughs> I remember yeah. reading some novel thing about the Roman emperors, and one of the crazy ones, Nero or something, decided to declare war on uh, Poseidon, and he sent his troops out to the water's edge and had them fire arrows into the ocean. 
Wow. And then declared his victory over Poseidon. <laughs> <laughs> it's all these poor soldiers are like, well, you got to do what the boss says. So they fired their arrows into the That's ocean. That's wild, really. They defeated Poseidon. And then he had a big party for four days. That's uh, interesting. Wow. I, wow. I, I guess it's I mean, probably a tall tale from his reign. Who knows? Anyway, all right. So character creation. Chasing waterfalls. Yeah, experimentation. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Well, thanks. We tried thanks. that, and you got into what else on day one? Yeah, I guess more specifically. Sure, sure. So yeah, so on um, on uh, on day one, you know, one of the very first things we started with was this idea of what are we talking about when we talk about play. And we started with Bernard Suit's definition, you know, that play is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. And that really, that's probably one of the things the group resonated the most with, or oh, with so which good. the group really seemed to resonate. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we returned to that again and again over the course of those three days. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so I said, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about, you know, play. And, uh, and then I talked about my own kind of journey into play and this, my interest into this, uh, started with board games and, and, uh, a Christmas gift back in a few years ago and, and, um, and kind of looking more into that and reading more and, you know, and, um, and learning more about kind of the, the presence, how really when we're talking about games, we're talking about play because games and play are, are the same thing you know that when you when you play you're doing a game when you do a game you're playing um mm. and um and then discovering more about how people have these theologians and thinkers and philosophers throughout history have have been drawn to this idea of the deep spiritual value of play and how play is something that has been a part of the human experience including adult human experience um, from the very beginning of time, you know, and, uh, and how it has these, these deep spiritual benefits and talked about this, this, you know, that, that quote from Bernard suits when he says play is our salvation, you know, and, uh, hmm. and how, and from, we talk about the quote from Jürgen Moltmann, he says, you know, play is how liberation happens, you know? Um, and, uh, and then we, we eventually got around to this idea from Parker Palmer, a, uh, a um a Quaker theologian who um a Quaker thinker who talks about play being a sign of our calling um that how we played as children is a sign of our of, of who God made us to be today mm-hmm. and uh so yeah that that was kind of the that was the the overall kind of trajectory of of day one um and just thinking about encouraging people to reflect on the role of play in their own lives specifically as after they played that game of just one you know how games Mm -hmm. help us to be present you know when we were playing just one we weren't worried about the future we weren't thinking Mm. about the past our past regrets you know because i asked them what were you thinking about during that time you know no one was thinking about the mistake they made at church you know last week and nobody was thinking about their Mm -hmm. worries about the church for next week they were just thinking about in this moment, you know, and how it's this tool for helping us be, be present to each other and to this moment. Um, and how it kind of gave us a sense of agency in these moments. You know, we, we felt like we, like we were, um, um, overcoming an obstacle, right. But it was a voluntary mm-hmm. obstacle and it was an unnecessary obstacle, but it was an obstacle. Um, mm. and, um, and so that brought us into this idea of play as grace you know, maybe as another name for experiencing grace where everyone's accepted, um, everyone is included. Um, really, anyone who's excluded is because they exclude themselves, you know. Um, um, and this day resonated, sounds like. Yeah, yeah. At That's least to, to me, it sounds like this day connected with people. Um, mm-hmm. it, at least I felt like it was, I, I felt good about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And day two, you shifted to barriers, where ways that we, you know, if this is so great, if, if we all played as kids and we like to play, why don't we play? And, exactly. And you got into a bit more history here, right? And so what did you explore? Right, right, yeah. Um, we, 
Um, exactly right. We said so. You know, so if this is all, if play is so great, why is it a a challenge for us? And I begin by talking about Bernard Suits, the Grasshopper, a little bit more in depth, and talking about this dream that the Grasshopper has in the book. And again. Dear listeners, you can go back and listen to those episodes on Board Game Faith if you want to hear more. But this dream the grasshopper has of he realizes that everything is play in this dream. And he goes out into the world as an evangelist to tell everyone, convince everyone, the dentist and the violin player and the plumber and the custodian and the carpenter and the pilot and the CEO to convince everyone that what we do is play. Everything during the day is play. And that when he convinces people of that, they instantly disappear because that's how resistant they are to it, to this idea. And, and so I talk about, you know, why is that? Why is that? And so we discuss why is that? Why are we resistant to play? And then we, we did, yeah, we went into some historical um, roots, at least, at least one historical root and a theological root. And, you know, I, I told people then, as I, you know, tell people, tell, as I will say now, you know, that I'm certainly no expert on this. Um, Kevin, I think you're more of an expert on this than I am, but um you know, that at least in my, my reading and my understanding, you know, at least one root or one contribution to, to this idea of theology of play, that play is, is a barrier to play is, um, can we trace back to the Reformation in, in some ways, you know, because what we see throughout most of human history is that play is an acceptable part of adult life until we kind of, but today we don't, right? Today we think eh, it's just for kids. And so we think, um, you know, so what happened, right? What happened? Um, and of course, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. You know, there's always been some resistance to it. And even today, there's some openness to it in the adult life. But, um, and I talk about, you know, that the Reformation, um, you know, is this uh, movement in Christian history about 500 years ago, where there was the perception, and I'm oversimplifying things, but this perception of, of, of the church teaching that we earn our salvation. And again, I'm over some of my things and Kevin, you know more about this than I, but, but this idea that we earn our salvation, you know, in particular, we earn our salvation by giving money to the church. We pay for these indulgences, right? And they, and this good work, this doing these good things, earn our salvation. We go to heaven because of that, or we can even earn our salvation for other people who have died uh, by giving to the church. And so the reformation started as, as a, in, in some ways, as a counter movement to that saying, you know, we don't earn our salvation. Salvation is God's good gift, free gift, what we call grace, right? But then it seems like there's part of, there's, there's just part of being human where we just, we can't accept that, right? We can't accept that, um, that, that our salvation, however we define that is just entirely God's good gift. We, we, because we're not sure about that, right? Because we don't have anything concrete that we can hold on to to say, oh, here, here's proof, right? That I'm going to go to heaven after I die or however we, however we define salvation. And, uh, and so pretty quickly they developed this idea of, well, you can't, you can't earn your salvation, but you know what you can do? You can prove your salvation. You know, you can prove that you're a good Christian by doing good works, right? And so this idea that the more you work, the more you contribute, the more you show that you are in God's good graces, and then that developed this idea of the Protestant work ethic, um, which is kind of then um, a short line from that to this idea that a person's productivity is is tied to their value, right? That our, our value and worth right. in God's eyes is tied to how productive we are. And, uh, and how that's a dangerous idea, that really it turns people into cogs in a machine. Um, it kind of dehumanizes us. Um, it... It was used as justification for enslaving people, um, and it kind of leads to the most um, corrupt forms of uh, exploitative forms of economic policy and economics today. Um, and uh, and and how that's a narrative that we have internalized over the last five hundred years. And so that's a barrier. Mm -hmm. One barrier to play is we think yeah. I'm not valuable as a human being unless I am productive. And, and so, so if I want to be even more valuable as a human being, I have to be even more productive. And, and by contrast, play is, um, takes away my value as a human being. Play is unimportant. Play is even, I, I talked about um, Jürgen Moltmann's, what he calls the morality of achievement. You know, so mm -hmm. achievement, productivity is moral. Play is immoral. 
you know, it's it's a vice. So anyway, that, that's kind of a little background. And then, and then I tied that into Genesis 3 and the serpent and Adam and Eve and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And of course, another bit to add to this is industrialization that, and there's some mm. ideas that the Protestant Reformation in, in, unintentionally created capitalism. There's, there's mm -hmm. this uh, idea from Max Weber, who was a German mm. economist thinker in the 1800s, but he theorized that, as you said, that, that if you're saved by grace, what you're not sure what you do, so you it may be, well, how do I know that I'm saved by grace? And the idea is, well, I would act like it, so then you would probably be good with money and good with your time, because so it becomes a backwards, as you said, salvation by works. Yes. And so that, that desire to look like you're saved led to saving money and, and frugality, which led to capitalism, because then people had money, and you didn't want to just make money and spend it. You wanted to have more money, which, I mean, everybody's always wanted to do, but it, the fact that you had capital-seeking returns creates capitalism. So it's, yep. it's a theory that can't be proved. But yeah, the Industrial Revolution is where we see clocks and where we see the idea of a weekend. It's where we see the idea of being paid for your time and your labor, not just who you are and what you do. Uh, the, you don't have an identity as a artisan. You have a, you're, you're an employee. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it creates this whole concept of, of as well as with industrialization, you get travel. So we have trains that have to be synchronized. We get airplanes, which mm, leads to, of mm. course, leisure and vacationing and the idea that you might go tour the great places of Italy, <clears throat> the great European tour, to go visit Venice, because nobody did that till the 1800s. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And it's all and because of boats and leisure and money. So with the, with the middle classes... And, and time and leisure and finances, you might go get on a boat for four months. Hmm. Which in some ways kind of, kind of workifies play too, in a way, you know, like it's like, yes. a, yeah, yeah. And so that's where we get that dilemma that suits and, and, uh, Jane McGonigal uh, or, or Moltmann and, and McGonigal too, a little bit. Yeah. They're all, they're all responding to this idea that we should work hard and then play hard. Because yeah. they feel like that's a false dynamic. Right. That ultimately play, that will lead you to working hard. Right. Play and is in service to work. Play is in service to work. And if you right. have, if you work hard enough, you can get a dream vacation that then will restore you to work hard. And that is, is a dilemma that will just make you miserable. Right. Exactly. So the response to it is to try to recover something outside of work. Right. This idea that play is an end unto itself. It's not in service yes, to anything. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're right. In some ways. We live in this weird time of history, and you wish you could go back, right, a thousand years, not only just to have custom-made clothes and, and walk around in mud, but also just to see how people did do leisure, because they were playing chess, as we've seen in Alfonso's Book of Games from the... <sighs> 1200s or right, whatever, right 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 yeah like people yeah. are playing games right and, and right we, we did, yeah we did this in a prior episode and people always play games but they didn't punch a clock but they right, did right. kind of farm and work all day long right and, and then when the sun women... went down they kind of had to go to bed because they had no light and they couldn't read and they had no books so it's yeah, weird yeah. it's so they weird they weren't up all night working on their computers and and answering right. email and yeah the, and, I... and the skit and Go the ahead. scary bit of history is we only we can only imagine what their lives were like because no one wrote it down. We have mm. no video. We have no audio. Mm. So we try to picture what the normal person's life was in Germany or Pakistan in the 1000s. And we, we, to be honest, we really don't know. Yeah, right? yeah. There's so much. Oh, it's so amazing. That, that we don't know. <laughs> that we just got to Yes, and the historians don't want to admit that because that would end their whole project. So right, right. They're going Including to constantly I, tell you what medi med 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 the medieval period was like, but we really don't know. Yeah, yeah. The theology is a lot like that, too, I think. Oh, yeah, I don't, that the... don't know. We have to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> don't going to like don't. that. Um, yeah, Wait, no. Who's that? No. Oh, it's the bishop calling. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Cut that out. <laughs> where's your where's your where's your your men in black memory eraser there the, exactly yes. um yeah yeah you know that was one of my i know we're kind of going on a, 
a tangent, but yeah, that was one of my biggest I surprises tangents, in, but yeah. in going to seminary was just like, we really, we really don't know much of this stuff. We're just kind of, right. yeah. Um, so, um, th- speaking of barriers to play and, and, and the, the book, the Alfonso's book of games, you know, t- and talking about the pictures of adults playing chess playing, you know, and, and men and women play together or uh, pictures of men and women playing. I, I cited that a little bit during the retreat because, Ooh. because, and I think this is a valid point that I had never thought of before, but some of our retreat participants observed that today they feel like there are more barriers to play for women than there are to men for men. Oh. And, and now there was some pushback on that or, or some counter voices. Somebody said, I'm not sure about that, but, but, a, but a lot of folks felt that way. And, and, and I thought that was a great observation. I really thought about that, but the point was the kind of observation was, you know, men today, you know, we can, uh, we can, um, we can wear board game t-shirts like I'm wearing right now. Right. And mm-hmm. we can, we can get together and make podcasts on board games and we can talk about star Wars and, and, uh, you know, all this stuff and, and, the, and society kind of gives us a little bit of a pass on that. Um, but some of the, some of the women who were there said, yeah, at least in their experience that maybe they feel like they get a little bit less of a pass, uh, from society on that, that, yeah. that at least, at least growing up, especially, you know, they're taught you really need to focus on, and this might've been a generational thing, but, you know, focus on kind of the more productive domestic things, you know, focus on yeah. learning to cook and clean and sew and, and which maybe have a maybe Barbie was, doll. Yeah. Whatever right, the origins, right. I mean, definitely yeah. the board game industry and hobby is dominated by white men. There's just yeah. no way around it. It's not exactly. everybody. And, no, and no. there's a lot of important voices out there. Um, uh, uh, so our family plays games, blackboard gaming, that th- yeah. th- there's yeah. right. So it is. And wonderful the, women's the, voices. The, yeah. Too. You just yeah. watch the videos. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, and, and it's wonder- Yeah, exactly. And women's voices yeah. in those examples and other women's voices too, that, um, yeah. um, but it's definitely sure, like, dominated out- by white men. Yeah. 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 So I thought that was interesting. Could I go on another, can I go on another theological tangent with you? Oh dear. Do you mind? Hang on. Let me see. I, <laughs> yeah, the bishop Kevin. says it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Kevin's got permission from the bishop. Okay, because this this might this, this is, is actually border. the remote to my AC unit. It's not even a, <laughs> it didn't have a fit. the bishop I is can't in use your my AC phone. It's unit. My camera. Right, right, yeah, right. That's so, my, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this dry erase uh, pen as my pretend phone. Um, okay, so um, that would be a great phone. It would a little dry it would fit erase. in your pocket. It would be that would be someone should do that. Yeah, plus you do, could uh, write with it. And you can write with it. That's the one thing phones can't do. I bet that's got to come now. Um, right. The um, so getting back to this idea of our reluctance to accept salvation as a gift, right, as grace, mm-hmm. and feeling like we have to prove it somehow. And again, I and I guess I'm 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 kind of begging the question of what salvation means. So I just kind of want to set that aside at the moment. Salvation means different things to different people. Sure. For some people, for a lot of people, it's like going to heaven. And different things people... in the Bible, to be honest. Exactly. Be honest. Yeah. Even yeah. And the Christian tradition isn't agreed on what it means. Yeah. So it's setting aside what, exactly what that means. But, you know, I just, I find that a fascinating concept, like why we are so reluctant as a species to accept that as just a gift that we have nothing to do with. Um, mm. I, I, and this, 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 okay, I'm going to get into the heretical here a little bit. So is the, is the bishop, the, if you got a call from the bishop, your bishop or, or let me know. Okay. Anyway. And, and your listeners call the bishop and then just put him on hold. Okay. Okay. You know, okay. by the way, some, some of so that way he's busy. He can't be watching. So, okay. Some of our listeners may be wondering, what is a bishop? Um, in the United Methodist church, which is the tradition of, of, uh, that Kevin and I are from, from the Christian tradition, we have these people called bishops who are kind of like essentially our bosses, is, uh, if, you, if you're kind of wondering what that is. Anyway. My boss is God, Daniel. Mm, <laughs> I like that. You I like, like that. that. My Sorry, boss bishop. is... I like it. I like it. I'm on a mission from God. Um, Blues Brothers. But so here's the thing. Yeah, I liked... I was a good Blues Brothers. So here's the... So here's where I'm getting to a little bit threat, heretical. But... I have found that sometimes, you know, we, in the Christian tradition, we say, well, you know, to be saved, you just have to believe, right? You just have to believe. You got to believe well enough or strong enough. You got to believe in just the right way. I kind of find like that's just like another way of 
earning salvation from work by, yes. by, by works. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's belief is a work that we do <laughs> to yes. earn salvation. Uh, it's you just another way in, a, in the appropriate way. Yeah. Exactly. It's just another way <clears throat> of earning salvation by our works. So even then we feel like we have to earn our, our salvation. Why is that? Why, why do we feel like, why can't we just receive it as a good gift? Do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts? I don't know the answer to that, but it's something I wrestle it's with. It's complicated. Yeah. I mean, clearly it, it, it's a loss of control. It's mm -hmm. uh, we're uncertain mm -hmm. what to do and make of it. I do think there's some honest questions there about morality and, and we do feel like we should respond to salvation with an appropriate lifestyle. And Jesus certainly embraces that type of thinking. I think it's fair yeah. to say because yeah. he condemns yeah. hypocrites. He condemns the yeah. powerful. He embraces. So there's a basic part of us that knows that salvation should lead to some kind of virtuous living or at least a change of heart. Yeah. So I think yeah. some of it is honest and real as well as, I mean, what are you going to do every day? You, you feel like, I mean, we can't just lay around all the time. So what do I do and how does that relate to salvation? So some of it I think is bad answers to genuine questions. Right. 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 And then some of yeah. it is a basic thing of we want to be in control and we are afraid to be vulnerable. Uh, yeah, it's it's multifaceted. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Oh, those are good. That's really good. You like That's that? Really well, good. I pondered it too. I pondered it too. Yeah, but, but yeah. I do have a little sympathy of. Well, shouldn't I do something? I, I think that yeah. that's a fine question, and there are some good answers. Like, yeah, yeah you should. Like even it, Jesus says, you should go make amends with your brother and sister. Exactly. Right. You so know, you I, should do something. That's not doing yeah. nothing. It's not quietism where you just sit around waiting. Right. I, I, one of the most challenging passages in a lot of ways in, in the Christian scripture, you know, I think it's, is it Matthew 25 where Jesus says at the end of time, the son of man, which is Jesus most frequent way of referring to himself probably um, says, we'll come and uh, we'll, we'll separate humanity into the, the, the goats and the sheep, right? And the sheep will go on to reward and the goats will go on to eternal fires. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and, and, and the basis for that is what we do, right? Yeah. And I, I always find that so haunting, you know, that, I mean, for, for those of us in the Christian tradition who like to preach, you know, salvation by faith, it's what, I mean, it, at least the basis in that, it's what we do. Mm -hmm. It's how we treat other people. Right. And, and, and I've heard some Christian comment, comment, commentators say, well, this is referring to, you know, how we Christians treat other, or this is, this is for people who are not Christian or whatever. And, I, I think that's kind of a stretch. I don't think Jesus, I'm, mm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, at least how I read that passage. Uh, yeah. Jesus, Jesus doesn't seem to say, this is, this is for those of you who aren't followers of me. He seems to be saying no, it's for everybody. Line up with the rest of his teachings. That's kind yeah, of would be yeah. an extraordinary claim. seems like. Yeah. Anyway, that was kind of a tangent, but thank you yeah. for, thanks uh, for these imparting your wisdom. Are we in cop? Well, it, it, it is a tangent, but it's not because it is it is the larger question of why are we not comfortable with accepting play and being the grasshopper? Exactly. Exactly. Meaning, of course, and background that that's an image that Bernard Suits uses that it's from Aesop's fables. The grasshopper played while the ant worked and in the winter time the ant had worked and stored food and survived and the grasshopper died because he played too much. Right. And right. Suits is trying to contradict that fable right right the morality and of that it, fable and he and yeah. he gets there ultimately by saying you know in the cosmic scheme of things in the cosmic scheme of things in this universe where everything is provided and, and we really can't generate anything uh, we can't really <sighs> produce anything in the cosmic right. things everything we do is unnecessary right right that, that if i die right now the universe is going to go on just fine. You know, I mean, of course, of course my family and friends will be sad or maybe some, some people who know me will be happy. I don't know, but not my family. They, they would be sad, of course. But, um, but, but in the grand scheme of things, the universe is going to go on just fine, right? That everything we do ultimately is unnecessary. And, mm -hmm. um, and on the, on the one hand, that's so liberating. I mean, it, it opens up the possibility for dedicating ourselves to a life of, of play in a way, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, maximizing pleasure. Yeah. We find it so, so 
so devastating too, because we all like to think that what we do is essential, right? For the running of the right. universe, that we, that we are essential to life. So anyway, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it makes me think of that uh, the poem. Is it Coleridge Kubla, uh Look on my works, you might Ozymandias. Look on my works, you mighty mm. in despair. So like he wanted to leave a list of conquests, and all that's left is part of a statue in the desert. So you wow, know, yeah, wow. it's really hard for us to accept the fact that we can't, we don't really put a dent in the universe. Yeah, yeah, we're just a little speck on the surface of another little speck on the surface of another little speck and yeah in an yeah. ai dimensional construct something so day three as we wrap things up yeah day three, so yeah so day being three constructive yeah moving yes. towards a playful life right right and day three we just talked about a, a couple of tools for leading uh, toward a playful life one was the gift of sabbath you know and sabbath is is this tradition where you know god wants us to rest god, um traditionally you know one day a week and and so we talked about you know i mean that that it, at least has many parallels with the theology of play right that uh rabbi heschel who mentioned earlier talks about sabbath is not in service to the rest of the week sabbath rest is not in service to the rest of the week of work sabbath is an end unto itself just as play is not in service to work, play is Correct. an end to itself. So it's the same point. Yeah, yeah. And so so the importance of incorporating Sabbath, however that might mean to us, into our mm -hmm. lives. However, because of feedback in that group, and it was such great feedback, it made me think, Kevin, that I think it would be helpful for us at some point to explore the difference between work and play and rest. You know, that I, I, I realized in hearing the participants talk that sometimes I equate play with rest, but that's not necessarily true, right? And so I just want to, I don't, I think I personally need more time to do, look into that and develop my thoughts on that, but I just want to lift that up that it may not mm. necessarily mm -hmm. be the case that play and rest are the same thing, but I just, right. something to explore at some point. Um, well, this did come, gosh, we're doing, making so many references here. This does come up with our discussion with Alex Radcliffe from Orthodox Judaism. Yes. The question of are yes. board games permitted on a Orthodox Jewish Sabbath day? And he yes. said you had to ask your local rabbi as if there are different interpretations. Are yes. board games considered a type of work or are they play or are they rest? Right, right. And there yes. is, yeah, it's a, that is a question of, of, of what is rest. Right, right. <clears throat> because then that gets into, you know, for what people who, who see their work as play, Mm -hmm. I mean, then if you, if, if you say your work is play, then you're working seven days a week, right? I mean, you never get a break from that. And that doesn't seem to honor the spirit of this idea of Sabbath, you know, that of, would um, not honor, honor Sabbath, but it would honor right. play if it right. is genuine right. play. Right. Right. Yeah. So that was the first tool for kind of moving toward a more playful life. And the second one was just discussing Jane McGonigal's idea of gamifying life, right? That, um, in the other six days of the week, recognizing that we have to work. How can we bring lessons of play to the rest of life? You know, how, how can we move work? If, if, if in some ways play is unnecessary obstacles that we voluntarily do and work is perhaps unnecessary obstacles that we are obliged to do, how can we make those obligations? How can we bring a sense of want to do to some of these obligations as well? Yes, yes. Um, and, and, and she's great to point to that crossover because work is also overcoming obstacles. How do you meet a deadline? How do you ship a product? Whatever your goals are, it, it can't be easy or else you, there wouldn't be a job to it. So right, work is right. also defined in some ways by overcoming obstacles. Yes, yes. Yeah, in fact, we really need to think that through because we're so, so there, there's an area of, of combination there. Yeah. Well, it suits, if suits is right, even those obligations we overcome, those obstacles we overcome in work are ultimately unnecessary, right? If suits is right. And so, mm -hmm. so is the difference that play is, a vol is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles and work is the obligatory attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles? Could Maybe. be. It could I don't be. know. I don't know. And also it seems, well... Games are also kind of, there's a ridiculousness to them. There is ridiculousness. Like they, they aren't productive. So right. work is productive. The, the grass is mowed. The, the, the product is shipped. But games, at the end of the day, it's just cardboard and 
arbitrary rules and little meeples. True, true, true. So there's something to the fantasy element, it would seem yeah. to me. But I do or remember... three-legged race. You know, like, why would you yeah. do that? Like, why, right. why wouldn't you? <laughs> right, it's kind right, of dumb. Right, right. It that's a good point. I, I, I don't know. I'm haunted by McGonagall, you know, also points out that sometimes play can be productive and sometimes work can be mm -hmm. non-productive too. You know, like, like I know I've come to the end of some days when I've been busy all day at work and I look back and I think, I haven't accomplished anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's but But there are stuff. other people that are spending hours prepping for a D&D &D session and it right, would look like right. work to an alien. Right, they're having right. to do all that. They're had to, some games are like homework, yeah. But it feels like play, not like work. And that's McGonagall's point. How do we bring a certain kind of joy to our our tasks? Yeah, and, yeah. and there's and she gives several answers to that with with um, room for failure and for nice rewards, a sense of re being rewarded for your actions. And uh, there's other things she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Wow, what a what a great conversation thank you dan is there anything we left well, out that you want to address thank you for thanks for, for thanks for asking about it kevin i appreciate it yeah. no no i i well no just oh maybe nothing yes. nothing left out but just but just a, a couple things here at the end if that's okay uh you, those mm -hmm. two sentences are contra those two clauses are contradictory but go ahead i know i'm, ahead, I'm nothing her. i'm a living contradiction i i <laughs> <laughs> including the contradiction of incompetence and survival to his this is Dan, <laughs> his my life. This is, yeah this is daniel's um, colombo colombo moment brief, well, brief leave, but before brief i leave possibilities. just a few questions brief yes. possibilities Three that's questions. right before i leave um, let me just ask you where were you uh, on the night of the 15th that's right that's right one just to say thank you kevin for your graciousness and your questions and uh, help so, and I learned a lot. explore this this episode. Please. Well, you were a huge. I mean, obviously, this is a joint conversation um, that you you have been a central part of. Um, secondly, uh, it, it, you you referenced just a moment ago how we how we have referenced so many different episodes uh, in the, in this one episode. We've talked about you know listen listen to that episode, listen to that episode. And it occurs to me as you say that just, um, just how grateful I am for this this ongoing conversation that that board game faith has been over the course of all of these episodes, um, not just you and me together, but with books we've been reading and with uh, guests that have been on here and hearing from our wonderful listeners, and just to affirm and say thank you to to you and to all of our listeners and to our guests that just. It is such a gift to get to be a part of this ongoing conversation, and um, I know you and I have talked about. You know I, what I love about this is I'm, I'm I, I feel like there aren't that many spaces in the world where this kind of conversation is happening about theology of mm -hmm. play, and so thanks for to everyone for being a part of this ongoing conversation. Um, it, it's yeah, it's just it's such a gift to be a little part of it. And the last thing is. Um, both and Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know both you and I would like to really give as much of ourselves as we can to this conversation and to be a part of this. All of which is to say, listeners, if you would like um, to have um, some um, class or lesson or presentation or teaching or resource for the theology of play. Um, in your circle, whatever that might be, whether that's a church or a temple or a mosque or your place of work or whatever. Um, and, and you think that we can help with that? Please let us know. Please reach out. Yes. We, we would love, we want to be available to do something like this um, in your world too. And um, so, yeah, please let us know. We, we're here. We're here for that. That's right. That's right. Well said, Daniel. Well said. Well, thanks to Thank all you. our listeners. You are awesome. And reach out to us on Instagram and let us know your thoughts. And, of course, always invite people to take a photo of themselves at their place of worship with hashtag board game faith. Let's keep that going because yeah. it's a lot of fun to see. And um, we look forward to the next episode. Right, Daniel? Anything else yeah. I forget? No, I think that sounds great. Um, okay. All thanks right. for listening. And, Kevin, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Always awesome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.